Hello, BookTube. All right, we're going to continue with this uh, <clears throat> impromptu library tour. I'm down in puppy territory. I've slowly been working my way down to the floor. There's no way to use the easy chair for this last bottom shelf, so I'm sitting on the floor, which is not good. <laughs> uh, and it looks to me we're doing the last of the shelves on this low bookcase underneath the window, and it looks to me like this bottom shelf also has a theme, just like yesterday's did, only whereas yesterday's theme was U.S. Presidents, Today's theme looks like the only group of people even more annoying <laughs> than U.S. presidents, writers. Uh, so we'll, we'll get through this as fast as we can, uh, starting all the way at the end here. Uh, okay, this is Claude. This is, an older, this is an older book. This is about 100 years old. Uh, 1940. That's going on a long time. That's 80 years. Uh, uh, this is The Spanish Adventures of Washington Irving. Uh, by Claude Bowers. This is, uh, Washington Irving never looked like that, <laughs> that cover illustration, just so we know. Uh, but this is uh, about Washington Irving, the great, uh, the first great American writer, the, uh, a writer I just adore, uh, who's, you know, he's, he's immortal, I can't complain, he's remembered, uh, you know, the Headless Horseman, all that, uh, Rip Van Winkle, that, that sort of stuff, but most of his great literary works are out of print or are in the public domain and forgotten and he is largely forgotten other than as a name and I, I think that's a shame I think that's a shame I'm, of the, I'm firmly of the opinion that uh, great writers are readable in almost all they do so why there isn't a Penguin classic for instance of his life of George Washington I don't know uh, but anyway uh, this, is, this is tremendously fun this was, this was written at a time when Irving was a, was a lot better known a lot more uh, commonly spoken of in the literary world, and it's just his stories. It's stories of his of his time uh, overseas as uh, not just a tourist, but also as an ambassador. Uh, I bet this is yeah okay. This is Philip McFarlane. This is Sojourners, uh, and the subtitle is a narrative of the human adventures as lived by some of historic dreamers and sufferers, including John Brown, Aaron Burr, Sir Walter Scott, Mary Shelley, John Jacob Astor, and Washington Irving. Uh, and Irving's spirit penetrates this book. This is a, a wonderful study of Washington and Irving. In addition to, you know, touching on all those other things, it, the, the, if, I think it's ama it would be amazing if you came out of this book and the main thing on your mind wasn't Washington and Irving. Uh, and it's also marvelously written. I'm sorry that it's not in print anymore, uh, but I bet, I'd be willing to bet a lot of these books aren't in print anymore. Okay, all right. All right, here is... Uh, this is another old one. This has got to be 80 years old as well. Uh... Well, no, okay, 75, 76 years old. This is uh, The World of Washington Irving by Van Wyck Brooks. This is um, the author of New England Indian Summer and uh, a whole bunch of other books. He did these literary survey books, uh, and they did well. Uh, they, they did well. This was, um, this was uh, okay, yeah, the cover cites the most, the one that did the best, The Flowering of New England. Uh, but they all they all did well. He did he did literary age books after that that took off. People liked the way he writes about literature. I think they still would if they read him. Unfortunately, the these books are all gone now. And even if they were to somehow come back, I think it's possible that their readership is also gone. Because Van Wyck Brooks writes from a point of view that where his readers know everything about the books that he's writing about, where they know the details, where they know uh, random quotes. And that isn't true anymore. Uh, most Americans don't know American literature. They know uh, the balkanized grievance literature of the 21st century, but they don't know anything about 18th century American literature at all, or 19th century American literature, or even 20th century American literature. The most they know, uh, college-age kids, the most they know about any of those eras of literature is that it's perfectly okay to disdain it without knowing anything about it. That, that's all they know, and so that's all they do. And so if they picked up Van Wyck Brooks, I don't know that they'd even know what he was talking about. In fact, I know they wouldn't. Uh, and they would also miss out on his the central assumption of what he's talking about, which is that all of this stuff is glorious and worth studying. They'd miss out on that as well, even if they knew the quotes. So it could be that those books are well and truly dead, uh, which would be a real shame. <laughs> that would be a real shame. Uh, oh, okay, all right. We saw this on this channel just recently. This is by Robert Crawford. This is Young Elliot. A fantastic biography of the young T.S. Eliot uh, that came to me last year and made me realize that it came to me as one of many books that came to me all at the same time or roughly the same time that were about T.S. Eliot and that made me realize okay you need to go back and re-examine Eliot and I am slowly doing that this year 
um, with mixed results. <laughs> ah, okay. All right, this is uh, The Life and Times of uh, Chaucer by John Gardner, the, the great novelist, who's a great novelist, I say, <laughs> even though he's not canonized as such and is only remembered, I think, in his literature for uh, his tiny novella, Grendel, which is taught in schools. Uh, he's not remembered for this book. This book, I think, is out of print. It's uh, they, he was he was a an academic as well and studied and taught Chaucer his whole life. And this is um, it received some scathing reviews when it came out. Uh, I love it. I think it's just one of the best things John Gardner ever wrote. And he wrote he wrote a lot. <laughs> and I love it all. I love his nonfiction works about writing and about fiction. Uh, I love almost all of his fictional productions. And uh, I think, if I remember correctly, maybe you could help me out here. I think there was a volume of his letters. His letters shine like the sun at dawn. They are incredible. A big collected volume of his letters would be very nice. <laughs> but this is very nice too. It's uh, it's impressionistic, and it some as often as it skims, it also deep dives. So I'm not sure that this would be a good first biography of Chaucer if you wanted to learn about Chaucer's life and times. Uh, but it will certainly make you love Chaucer. It will certainly convey that to you. You will be infected and want to read Chaucer if you read this, and maybe that's the whole point. Uh, okay, then, all right, this, this was inevitable, so buckle down. Uh, we now enter into a small bank of Byron. <laughs> this, is, this is Leslie Marchand. This is his one-volume uh, recension of his multi-volume Byron biography. I don't have the multi-volume books, but this one is really good. You can usually trust the author of a multi-volume biography to do a great one-volume abridgment, and uh, in this case, it's true. So, uh, probably still the Byron biography to beat. Not that it, uh, that anybody reads Byron's poetry or really cares, but uh, nevertheless, he is regularly the source of biographies, uh, like this one, Phyllis Grothkurst, The Flawed Angel, uh, which delves into his uh, psychology and his psychosexuality uh, a little bit more than the others do. I'm kind of amazed there are a couple of other uh, big Byron books that I don't seem to have here. I, I don't think we're going to go through the same trauma that we did yesterday where I was looking at my president shelf and realizing how many presidential books I don't have. Uh, but even so, I should have at least eight Byron biographies, and I only, I only appear to have three. Because this next one doesn't count, and this is another example of why I'm glad to be doing these shelf tours, because they are helping me to winnow and organize my shelves. And this book... Good as it is, does not belong here. This is The Politics of Paradise by Michael Foote. And it's a study of Byron. It's a study of his biography. It's a study of his life. It's a study of his literature and the uh, incendiary nature of it. And it's, it's a literary study. So, you know, it's tempting to have all of that thematically connected. But it's not a biography. You couldn't use it as a biography. So it doesn't really belong here. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, right. Okay, great. Uh, uh, this is... Boy, I wish, wish I had this in a slightly more durable format. This is Anne Fleming's Byron the Maker, a terrific biography, uh, and not one of the ones that you will hear about, one of the one-volume of the one volume ones that you will hear about. Uh, I could swear that I had uh, Andre Moreau's biography of Byron as well. I could swear that I had that, but I don't see it here, and this is where it would be. Uh, but this is, this is really, really good. I, this came out in 2007, I think. Uh, 2009, uh, and I have just this this flimsy paperback. I kind of wish I had the hardcover. Uh, all right, well, that got us through the Bank of Byron. <laughs> now we'll move on from the... Ah, okay. All right, this is David Skull's biography of Bram Stoker, Something in the Blood. Uh, big atmospheric thing about the man who gave us Dracula. A very, very good story. Bram Stoker's story is really good. It's a really good biography. A lot of writers don't have that, and he does. And this author has a lot of... Uh, controversial theories to put forward <laughs> about Bram Stoker. I didn't agree with some of them, others that I did, I, but it's fascinating reading from beginning to end. Just, uh, oh, oh, okay. All right, this is, uh, this is a classic. Just flat out a classic. This is a must-have. Uh, this is Juliet Barker's The Brontes, her enormous biography of the Bronte sisters and Bramwell Bronte and uh, the parents and the world. It's just... 
This is everything the literary biography is supposed to be. This is the, not just an introduction, but also a walking tour, an explanation, an explication. Just oh, <laughs> such a masterpiece of a book. And readily available. There was an updated version, I think, after this. There are paperbacks. This is, uh, this is a book, to, if you love the Brontes, I, lo I love the Brontes. In fact, I've grown to love them more as time goes on. And if you love them, you have to have this book right along with them and read it because <laughs> this is this is everything that you don't get in the introductions to their books or in their books themselves uh oh oh great okay uh this next one is alfred habiger this is my my wars are laid away in books his great biography of emily dickinson the best biography of emily dickinson i've ever read she's a little bit elliptical as a subject for a biography didn't want really to be remembered by history and uh took very effective steps to make that sure that that, that that she never was remembered by history so it's a task to do not so much a biography of her as an interesting one as one in which she comes off as anything other than a raving nut job <laughs> uh, and this is this is uh smart and really sympathetic along those lines uh oh great okay uh this is walter jackson bates great biography of john keats and it had the uh the i found a hardcover with a dust jacket at the prattle uh, it is the greatest Keats biography, even though, again, I should have at least two others, and I don't. Uh, there are at least two others that are really good that I don't have. Uh, I found a hardcover dust jacket uh, at the at the Brattle, and the dust jacket was just maroon. Just maroon all over with the name John Keats on it. I thought that was kind of boring. So I put a picture on the, on the, uh, on the front, and I put a picture on the spine. Just so that I would have... This is my own copy. I'm never going to get rid of it. I, I go back to, to bait all the time on... This and his book on Samuel Johnson, so uh, I just fixed it up for myself. <laughs> although, although now that I think of that, now that I say that, I am not seeing his book on Samuel Johnson. Could it be that I don't have Jackson Bates' book on Samuel Johnson? That would be pretty bad. <laughs> that would be pretty bad. Uh, ah, okay. This next one is something that you do only find at the Brattle. I find you find these things regularly at the Brattle. Uh, and this is Samuel Longfellow's two-volume Life and Letters of. Uh, his father, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, um, which has, you know, original documentation that all other biographies will have to consult. That's, that's the thing about these 19th century biographies, these two and three volume biographies that are lives and letters with extracts and all that, is that they, they are a priceless assemblage of original documents. You need to have them. Uh, and this is very good. This is, this is, uh, this came out in 1886. Uh, this is the life of a man of letters who was a worker, a faithful user of his powers, one who had m too much respect for his art ever to permit any carelessness in the execution or unworthiness in the theme. His art he valued, not for its own sake, but as a vehicle for noble, gentle, beautiful thought and sentiment. If he spoke of common things, it was to invest them with the charm of saying, or show that poetic element in them which would lift them above the commonplace. <laughs> That was written in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1886. Uh, and I don't know of any modern biography of Longfellow that is any good, so, so I have this one instead for now. Uh, this next one is, again, uh, you can usually trust the author of a multi-volume work to do a good job with their own one-volume uh, abridgment. You can usually trust that would be true. Those authors know that the marketplace is only going to support the abridgment, not the multi-volume work. The multi-volume work is usually for scholars. And the one-volume work is their chance to get the History Book Club, the Book of the Month Club, all that sort of stuff, back when those things did that sort of thing. And this is, an, <clears throat> this is a perfect example of this. This is Leon Edel's Life of Henry James in one volume. Edel wrote five volumes on, on James. And they, are, they, have been, they were uh, epically dismissed by Gore Vidal as a great work of historical fiction. Uh, that was sour grapes on Gore Vidal's part, as most things were. <laughs> this is actually a tremendously good biography. Heavily detailed. <laughs> even this book, even just the one book, is so huge. Even the abridgment is gigantic, because uh, Edel goes into every detail of James's life. And, and the, the thing about gnomic pronouncements like Gore Vidal's is that you're not supposed to examine them. 
No one's, no one's supposed to go up to Gore Vidal at a, at a book signing for Lincoln and say, when you said Leon Edel's book was a great work of historical fiction, what did you mean? Could you point out something that he declares as fact that is actually fiction? No one actually did that to Gore Vidal, and no one ever would. No one was that brave. So as a result, we have that thing hanging over this book, but I, I strongly recommend the book. Uh, oh, all right. Well, here is uh, Catherine Duncan Jones's The Ungentle Shakespeare, Scenes from His Life. Uh, a, a Shakespeare biography, but a lot more pointed and ragged, a lot more, uh, a lot less uh, hagiography and a lot less of the sentimental, oh, you know, he belongs to the ages type of uh, rodomontade that usually accompanies Shakespeare biographies. That's why this is so thin. Uh, I liked it a lot. I had heard all, about it a lot before I read it, and uh, I thought it was just tremendously bracing. Very, very enjoyable. Uh, again, I'm thinking I should have more Shakespeare biographies than I'm seeing, uh, but that's probably not the last time we'll see Catherine Duncan Jones because she's she's really good. Uh, this next one is Mark Anderson. This is Shakespeare by another name. His big biography of Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, who uh, uh, the author proclaims is Shakespeare, wrote Shakespeare's plays. The uh, the case for the Earl of Oxford isn't very good. <laughs> the case for any substitute Shakespeare isn't very good. The dates are all wrong. Uh, the incidents in, Oxford life's, uh, in Oxford's life are uncannily similar to the incidents in Shakespeare's plays. Uncannily similar. Down to small details. It's usually a recitation of those details, of the things that actually happened to Oxford. It's usually a recitation of those details laid side by side with details in Shakespeare's plays that convinces people of this case. They usually don't know one way or another. Nobody knows about the Earl of Oxford ahead of time. Then they see that list and think, okay, well, that's, that's far, far, far beyond happenstance. That has to be a definitive case. Uh, um, and that certainly has that effect. This is, this is the book-length version of that list. Uh, the, the fatal counterpoint is the dating. The dating is all wrong. So you not only have to be willing to... Uh, to, ex uh, to accept the possibility that someone other than Shakespeare wrote the plays of Shakespeare, but you also have to be willing to say that the, that the dating and the timetables for both Oxford and Shakespeare are wrong, and sometimes on no evidence at all. So it's fascinating to read. It was a fascinating book, but uh, it founders in the same way that all these things do, by putting forth a candidate. Uh, let's see. Uh, what is it? Oh, okay. This is C.P.V. Akrig. The author of a Jacobean pageant, which I think we saw. I think it's actually right over my shoulder. Let me see. <laughs> it's right above the wing of this chair. Uh, anyway, uh, this is Shakespeare and the Earl of Southampton. About Shakespeare's patron. Uh, and his, it's a large part of his life. Um, and uh, really good biographical, inter in the way that life touches on the world and, and what we know of the life of Shakespeare. Very, very good book to have on the subject. Uh, the only one because he dismisses uh, A.L. Rouse's book on Southampton. He dismisses, he dismisses that book out of hand very early on in his own book. I think there's a, a footnote. I might be able to find it uh, relatively quickly uh, because it's, uh, it's withering. <laughs> it really is withering. Um, let's see. Oh, well, no, maybe not. I thought it was right at the beginning. Uh, it's the uh, it's the task of every, of every or it used to be the task of every uh, academic um, to dismiss all his predecessors. <laughs> this, this is where the anxiety of incubus comes from. It used to, uh, it was the task of every academic to, uh, to summarily dismiss all the writers, of the previous writers on his own subject. Uh, and at one point, I don't. I'm not going to find it here. But at one point, he does that with Rouse. Uh, he he says that Rouse's book is not worth paying attention to. That, that all of it is dismissible. Uh, let's see. Am I going to be able to find it? Uh, okay, page four. I should have gone right by it then. It's the first one. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> no, no. Uh, for fuller information on the origins of the family, see A.L. Rouse's uh, 
article in the Huntington Library Quarterly. With a few minor changes, this is reprinted in the first chapter of his book, Shakespeare's Southampton, Patron of Virginia. And then the final line of that note is, most of the rest of the book is of little worth. That's <laughs> how so academics spat with each other. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, we go from the sublime to the ridiculous now with the journals of James Boswell. Uh, this is, I think, one volume. This, is, this covers 1762 to 1795. Uh, oh no, no, this isn't. This is this is a, an abridged and heavily annotated, wonderfully annotated uh, abridgment of the whole of the journals of James Boswell, which really do make fantastic reading. Boswell's journals are fantastic. His London journal is amazing. It deserves a place on the shelf right alongside his life of Boswell or life of Johnson as a great work, and it does not have that place, oddly enough, uh, which is why, although I have a couple of Boswell books out here, I have the London journal in the little book room because I go back to it more often than I do these things. Uh, and the next thing here, the next Boswell thing, is just a great biography. This is Peter Martin's Life of James Boswell. Just a fantastic biography. Just uh, not as entertaining as Boswell's own life, as of Boswell's own writing on his life. He never stopped writing. And he, he wrote a lot about himself, more about himself than anyone else. And he's endlessly entertaining, provided you have someone uh, like John Wayne giving you uh, really good notes. Provided you have someone giving you the lay of the land, then he's really good on his own life, better than anybody could be. But this is really good as well. This this covers a lot of things that jo that Boswell would never have thought to cover. Uh, and, uh, oh, okay, Kenneth Muir, The Life and Letters of Thomas Wyatt, uh, Tudor poet and Tudor mover and shaker and power baron and whatnot. Uh, and and uh, surprisingly heavy on the life considering that uh, the letters were the forte of this particular editor. I, I really like this book. I really do. It shouldn't, if, if, if this is here, then so should be, uh, the, I think I have two other Wyatt books here, <laughs> somewhere in, on these bookshelves. I think we've already seen one of them. If this is here, then that should be as well. If this is going to be writers, then it should be all the writers. Uh, oh, oh, this was so good. This is Vivienne Forrester's Virginia Woolf, a, a slim little thing. Virginia Woolf, of course, has had massive biographies written about her, including a great one by Hermione Lee. And when I saw this coming, this was uh, 2011? Is that right? 2015. When I saw this coming from uh, Columbia, I thought, okay, well, it'll be a dry academic study, and it, it, it might interest, but it won't, it won't in any way dislodge the great big biographies of Woolf that I've already read, and instead it's better than all of them. It's, it's an unbelievably electric work of writing, just fantastic try and find it if you're if you're a virginia wolf fan try to find it because if you're a virginia wolf fan you might have missed it it's by a comparatively small academic press and it came and went and a lot of retail bookstores in america don't even carry academic presses so it's vivianne forrester try to find it at your library or or a used bookstore or something and give it a try i think you'll be very pleased <laughs> Uh, oh, okay, all right, next we have a, okay, we have two banks coming up, three books each, and then we'll be done. <laughs> so the first bank is Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, this is uh, Edwin Haviland Miller's Salem is My Dwelling Place, a big, somber, heavy, uh, heavy on the academics life of, of Hawthorne. Then we have James Mellow's uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne in his times. Uh, this, here you have the, <laughs> A visual signifier of the approaches of the two authors. One has the old man uh, Hawthorne on the cover looking like God himself. The other has the young Hawthorne looking like a different kind of God himself, like a Dionysian God himself. And that is not uh, as handsome as Hawthorne got. This picture is actually 10 years later than when he was a college student. And when he was a college student, he looked... Uh, You've just never seen anyone as attractive, just never in your life. <laughs> and, and uh, oh, here we have, there's the old Hawthorne right there. Uh, and uh, these two are great ruminations, big, you know, uh, uh, everything in the kitchen sink ruminations on Hawthorne's life. And so is this one, but this one is uh, much smaller and I think much better. This is my favorite of them all. This is Philip McFarlane, who we've already seen. He did the Washington Irving book. And this is uh, Hawthorne in Concord. And it's a thin thing. But it, if you're looking for a place to start with a Hawthorne biography and these things look like, these tomes look like a little much, then try and find this one uh, because it is delightful. Absolutely delightful. Really captures the man. Uh, and then the, that was the bank of Hawthorne. The next bank is far less justifiable. <laughs> it's an author who has, who has uh, since been largely forgotten. And this is Sir Philip Sidney. 
Uh, the first volume is from Yale, uh, and it's, I'm sorry, it's, a, it's in a bit of a mess. Uh, and it's a collection of, there was a, a small tranche of letters that was found and analyzed by scholars. And this, uh, this author, um, James Osborne, uh, puts them in their perspective. That is the young Philip Sidney. Uh, and this is, this is I, I just put that on the cover because it's a naked cover. I don't have the dust jacket for it. And the book itself is... Uh, fairly beaten up, and that's because it's one of the books that survived the fire. I had had a fire in an old apartment of mine, uh, and it wasn't in my apartment. It, the fire was in the apartment directly below, and I was out of town. For the first time in forever, I had left town. And so the people who were in my apartment got my beagles out safely, and the fire department came, and to put out the fire, they just blasted their hoses into the front windows on all three floors. And the, so the water on the third floor, where I lived at the time, smashed through the window and crossed the room in a neat arc and just blasted the far wall, which was biographies. Just it spent, spent, you know, an hour blasting that wall with water and then the, you know, the crew came in and raked all of the soaked books into a big man-high pile in the middle of the room and hardly any of my biographies survived that. And this is one that just barely did. I, it, it, it still, if you open it up, you can still smell that fire, which is really eerie. But I've held on to it because it, it, you know, it's kind of a survivor. <laughs> uh, and I've also never seen the book again, the, this collection of letters. It's really interesting too. But, uh, but in addition to a collection of discrete letters, you also need one volume biographies of Sidney. If you're me, most people don't need one volume biographies of, of Philip Sidney, but I do. Uh, this is the first one was by Emma Denker. This is Immortal Sidney. This is from a hundred years ago when a writer could, yeah, 1931, when a writer could call him immortal. He's not anymore. No one reads him for pleasure. Uh, but this is full of all of the mythology and the great romance. And then there's Catherine Duncan Jones, who we saw with Ungentle Shakespeare. She did a great book on Philip Sidney, the great Philip Sidney biography that uh, I don't think has ever yet been surpassed, um, that deals with all the aspects of his life as a courtier, as a historian, as a satirist, as a poet, uh, as a, a, a social figure after his death that just... Wonderful, wonderful stuff. A wonderful little uh, x-ray of Elizabethan society. Uh, and there you go. There you go. That is, uh, that is the, the uh, bottom shelf of this book. Excuse me. The bottom shelf of this bookcase, all writers. Uh, and now we're done. <laughs> and now all that remains is for me to somehow figure out a way to restore feeling to the lower part of my body. <laughs> I'll, I'll work on that. <laughs> but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.